is part of how cortisol is produced is through light. It's through predominantly sunlight. And there's a balance between cortisol and melatonin. Um, and when you get, especially morning time sunlight exposure, your body does really better um, at producing melatonin in adequate quantities to counterbalance cortisol. But if we look at, at cortisol and melatonin, so um, cortisol is supposed to be in the morning time so if this is, you know, a.m., and this is lunch, and this is afternoon, and this is night, we look at, you know, where, where does cortisol, how is cortisol produced? So in the morning time, cortisol is at its highest, okay? And then as the day goes on, cortisol drops a little bit. And then as we get into the afternoon hours, cortisol drops a little bit more. And then as we get to nighttime, cortisol drops to its lowest point. And so it almost follows like a lazy curve, right? This lazy curve. This is what a cortisol curve looks like. So cortisol is not something that you can go to your doctor and have measured. A lot of times the doctors, they'll measure your cortisol, they'll draw your blood, right? And they'll measure this moment in time right here, but they don't measure these other moments in time. And it's very important to understand because cortisol follows a pattern. If you don't measure the different aspects of, of that pattern, then you could get a very misleading morning cortisol. It's not uncommon to see morning cortisol be normal, but to see the afternoon cortisol be too high, right? So, so but if you're not measuring it, you never know. So like, instead of the curve looking like this, some, sometimes what we'll see is the curve will look like this and then it'll actually shoot up and then it'll kind of drop at night but it'll still stay high so like you can get a curve that looks very very different and the problem with this is this would be an example of cortisol overall that's too high throughout the course of the day and why is that a problem because when cortisol is high if you have high cortisol high cortisol elevates your blood sugar High, and this is over time. So if this is happening consistently day in and day out, this is what will happen. It elevates your blood pressure, okay? And high cortisol over time reduces your muscle. So it actually eats through muscle and high cortisol over time reduces your bone. That's why if you've ever taken cortisol or gone to your doctor and they prescribed it to you, usually they don't just say, here's cortisol, take it forever. They say, let me give it to you for 10 days. It's something called a medrol dose pack where they'll give it to you in a high doses for a short period of time to prevent these types of problems from happening. Because if they gave it to you long term, one of the side effects is this right here. And so a lot of you, maybe, maybe you're on corticosteroids, maybe you're on a low dose cortisol based steroid hormone, because so, some doctors do this anyway, despite these other risks. And again, then you end up with something like osteoporosis, right? Because we know cortisol elevations over time cause these problems. And so again, going back to if you're just measuring that morning cortisol only and you're not seeing that pattern as it evolves, because another pattern that we'll sometimes see is that cortisol be normal in the morning and then it'll drop, right? And it'll stay lower than what it should. And this is a classic example of a person who is tired all the time. Their cortisol Maybe they wake up and they feel okay, but their cortisol uh, drops to such a great degree over the course of the day, they're tired all the time. Other patterns that we'll sometimes see, again, if you're, if you're measuring it in the morning, um, sometimes we'll also see a pattern where it is low in the morning, and that might be helpful, you know, but again, it's only one reading, and so it'll be low in the morning, and it'll spike at noon, and then it'll come down again in the afternoon, and then it'll go up again at night. And so what happens is you're tired in the morning when you're supposed to have energy and then you're wired at night when you're supposed to be able to go to sleep. And so sometimes we refer to this up down pattern with cortisol as wired and tired. These individuals when they're supposed to be energetic, they're not. And when they're supposed to be sleepy, they're not. And so then a lot of times they evolve their mind if this is happening to them over time and they think that they're a night person. Right, I'm just a night person. That's just who I am. You're not a night person. Um, if this is happening to you, this is very much a hormone disruption because remember, cortisol keeps your brain awake. That's why it's so important that cortisol drops at night. It allows your brain to fall asleep and melatonin helps this process. So again, cortisol and melatonin 
they really kind of counter each other. So when cortisol is high, melatonin is low, and when cortisol is low, melatonin generally is high. That's the pattern that these two, the dance, or if you will, the weave that these two play with each other. So it's important to understand that um, cortisol can't just be measured at one slot in the day. And this is, again, I've seen a lot of medical doctors be really guilty of this, and then they just dismiss the patient as not having an issue at all uh, as it relates to, to their adrenal gland function. So again, um, stimulants can, can cause hyperexcretion of cortisol, adrenaline, and uh, noradrenaline. Uh, chronic, and I said as well, chronic prescription stimulants Lack of sunshine for that reason. Sunshine balances, helps with melatonin regulation. And then we get lack of sleep. That lack of sleep can really affect how your adrenal glands uh, um, are capable of functioning. They, they need that recovery at night. And if you're not sleeping to get that recovery, you're gonna, again, you're gonna develop, long-term, you're gonna develop this adrenal fatigue issue. So these are all causes. So these are all, what's good about this chart is that you can change any one of these things, right? You have this freedom of choice to do any of the things as it relates to this list. So like if you have a chronic infection, you, you can make a choice to visit a doctor to get a diagnosis and to get it treated. If you have hypoglycemia, you can make a choice around eating. I, can't, I hear this all the time. People say, I have hypoglycemia. I have this eating problem. No, you have hypoglycemia probably because you eat like garbage and your blood sugar doesn't know up from down. And if you exercised and you got proper sleep and you regulated your diet with real food, then hypoglycemia wouldn't be something you had. So again, it's, it's one of those things that we can't, we can't say, I, I own this disease and I have it. And therefore, I'm just going to be a victim to it. We have to own why we are struggling with this state. And so this is 100% adjustable. Chronic inflammation, you can find out what the triggers are. There are a number of different triggers to chronic inflammation, food being one of them, um, chemical exposures being another, uh, microbial imbalance being another, nutritional deficiencies being another. Like those are four very common triggers for chronic inflammation. Same thing with chronic pain. Why does the chronic pain exist? Maybe you have an injury that needs to be rehabbed. Maybe you're Pain is in existence because you don't exercise enough and your muscles have atrophied and they've shrunk and now they're, they're not limber enough and so you get up to try to move them and they're stiff and you injure yourself, right? So movement and activity for many people is, what, is what's necessary to overcome chronic pain. Chronic stress, this, is, you know, this can be emotional, right? Some people have emotional stress and so sometimes you can control that and other times you can't control it as well. And so um, control it where you can and when you can, otherwise you run into big trouble. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about, more about different types of stress because I think it's an, an important delineation for you as well. So many of you, um, we talk about good and bad stress, but what, what are the types of stress? There's, there's emotional stress, which, you know, you, you, can, you can make choices here. You, you can choose, you know, you can choose who you hang out with. This is a big part of emotional stress, bad relationships or, or, or bad symbiotic uh, communication. Um, but there's emotional stress, that's one type. There's physical stress. And for most people, it's not too much exercise as much as it is too little exercise because lack of physical activity is stress. It's just the wrong kind of stress. Because lack of physical activity tells your body to secrete hormones that break your muscle down because you're not using your muscle. And so therefore your body tells you, tells itself, we don't need all this muscle. Let's deteriorate it and re repurpose it and recycle it. And then there's chemical stress. And so physical stress is pretty either easy. It's either too much or too little or it's traumatic injury, right? Those are the primaries of physical. Emotional is generally relationships and spirituality. Um, and then we have chemical stressors, and chemical stressors can be, you know, what are the chemical stressors? Infection, microbial imbalance, nutritional deficiencies, uh, chemical exposures, you know, this could be something like a toxic heavy metal exposure or mold exposure or gluten sensitivity because food and food reactivity is chemical, right? Because it's something you put in your body that affects you in a good or a bad way, so you get chemical stressors from food. So where most people struggle is right here. Now, a lot of people struggle here too. This oftentimes doesn't require like a super objective analytical chemical analysis. This just requires acknowledgement 
and addressing. And this sometimes, this just requires acknowledgement and addressing, and sometimes it requires counseling, and sometimes it requires uh, kind of a deeper insight into oneself. Um, but all again, all these things are choices that you can make. You can choose to do counseling. You can choose to move more. You can choose to measure the potential for these things. And therefore, when you're doing that, you're choosing to identify what's causing or contributing to your chronic stress. And then subsequently, you can choose to change it and change the outcome, which again, in the case that we're talking about today, is this adrenal fatigue. So choices, you have them. You should, uh, you should exercise making them and to improve upon your situation. But sometimes we don't know what choices to make. Sometimes we don't have the knowledge or the skill set to understand what choices are best to make. That's where it's important if you find yourself there to get to work with a professional who understands these different things and really um, get to the bottom of it. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.